welcome to Legal Cut Pro, the Canadian Entertainment Law Podcast. My name is Michelle Molyneux. And I'm Greg Peng. Today's podcast is a bonus episode. So what do we have in store for this bonus episode, Greg? Well, this episode is going to be a recording of my panel, I suppose. or It's more of a presentation, not panel, because it was just me, so you can't call just one person a panel, I suppose, <laughs> right? Uh, it was recorded at the Banff Story Studio on March 10th, uh, 2019. It was during my session, my presentation called Lawyering It Up, Working with Entertainment Law. And the Story Studio, Banff Story Studio, was, as it sounds like, it was in. It took place in Banff, Alberta, rather. And it was uh, essentially a three-day-long workshop series for um, entry-level and, I think, mid-level filmmakers. So th- there was quite a diversity in... Uh, I guess experience levels uh, mm. in, in the audience. So, but but uh, it was a it was a really fun session to to deliver. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. I wish I could have been there in person, but I'm excited to to listen in for what we have in store. Do you want to do our sponsor? This podcast is brought to you by Ampia and its professional development team. And special thanks to our editor Jane Too Good who edits our audio for us. It makes us sound really good. And you can find Jane on Instagram at JJ underscore too good. That's JJ underscore and two with T-O-O good. And with that, uh, I suppose I just uh, mentioned a couple things about um, the, 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 the session that I held. The audio is not ideal. Uh, I did have my computer patched into their soundboard and BAMF, the, the staff at the Mount Center was fantastic. They provided me whatever I want, but it was due to uh, my... Um, I'm not the best audio person, so I didn't quite test the the levels properly, right? Uh-oh. So, so I thought, yeah, that sounded pretty good, and then I recorded and I thought, yeah, that's good. But uh, it, it peaked at a few times, so especially uh, this uh, this one point where I actually yelled something, and then and it's like it's like hopefully it doesn't jar people too badly who are listening here. <laughs> Be prepared, listeners. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and did I mention the title yet of the talk? Uh, I think I did, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I did. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was a uh, uh, talking. It was essentially a, a bit of a one hundred and one. Um, on how to, you know, okay, yeah, what uh, what kind of legal issues are involved? You know, what, what kind of law uh, should you be at least aware of? You know, this is, uh, it wasn't a session to tell you how to practice law or anything like that. It's, uh, Darn. You know, a little bit, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to take that one. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, um, it's a little bit of corporate, you know, how corporate applies when you're, when you're um, in doing film production as an inter- independent producer, how intellectual property applies. Uh, I think I talked a little bit about privacy law. So uh, just a little bit about those things and, and what you have to be aware of as an independent producer. So you know when, you know how to recognize issues and know how, would know at least a little bit about when to seek help, you mm-hmm. know, when, when you need to lawyer up, I suppose, right? Yeah. Something else that I need to mention is uh, upon listening to the recording, I realized that I didn't explain, uh, as you probably know, Michelle, explaining like legal stuff and then not knowing that whoever you're talking to might not have the background in, in particular words or the vocabulary that you're using. Mm-hmm. And one of the pieces of vocabulary that I use was statutory damages. There was a question about copyright law and uh, what can I do if someone infringes my copyright? I said, okay, can you sue them? And then the relief you seek for, for an infringement is uh, you can seek statutory damages under the Copyright Act in Canada, along with you know accounting for profits as well for your, your actual damages. So what are statutory damages? <laughs> Good question. I, I wish someone asked me that because I just plowed right through that uh, during the uh, s- uh, seminar there. So statutory damages are damages as prescribed under statute and uh, hence statutory damages. So here the, the statute we're talking about here is the Copyright Act. And under the Copyright Act, if someone infringes, if you're successful in an action in infringement, then you're entitled to statutory damages. And those are damages that are prescribed under the legislation, which you do not have to prove. So that was the problem of before the last round of amendments to the Copyright Act was that you had to prove your damages. So if you stole, you know, let's stole my script or something like that, mm-hmm like in terms of infringed on it, you know, under, under, as, as it's defined under the Copyright Act, then if I'm successful in that action, and then the next step is, okay, so what are your actual damages? It's like, well, I don't know. Um, you know they copied it. Uh, they should make any money. Well, no. Uh, or maybe just a small amount. So you're spending perhaps tens of thousands of dollars, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars on this lawsuit, and you could barely prove, say, even $5,000 in 
actual damages uh, mm-hmm. you know even if you're if you're so lucky so statutory damages provides that there is a level and it, there's difference between commercial and non-commercial infringement under the copyright act um, where you are entitled to those damages and there's a range simply by the fact that you have made the case you have proven your case of infringement against the defendant mm-hmm. so, so you don't have to prove those damages but you can also prove actual damages as well so okay. That's statutory damages. Yeah, that's that makes sense. Damages under the legislation that you are entitled to get if you are successful in that action. Oh, well, I like the sounds of that. I like being entitled to money. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. After spending a lot of money on that lawsuit. Aww. So, yeah, you're. <laughs> <laughs> One more thing I'd like to add is that the slideshow that I used during the seminar is up on uh, my website at uh, redframelaw.com. I think it's one of the recent. Uh, Post in the blog section, so awesome. uh, That was posted on SlideShare and and it's accessible via uh, the blog on my website. And I think that's it. Where can listeners find us? Yeah, so if they want to reach out to you, Greg, uh, Greg's email is greg at legalcutpro.com, and my email is michelle at legalcutpro.com. And you're on Twitter, right? Aren't you, Greg? At Cyclaw, C Y C L E W, the original cycling lawyer. That's awesome. (laughs) And uh, you can find me on Instagram, and that's at Michelle Molyneux. And I do have pictures of my dog there. Excellent. Definitely check that out. Yes. (laughs) Hey, excellent. So I hope you enjoy the interview, not the interview, the the seminar recording. Thanks for listening. All right. We are finally ready to go. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Pang. I am a lawyer, and uh, I'm going to be talking about entertainment law today. <laughs> I suppose so. Just to give you a little bit of a heads up, I am recording this uh, session, and it will be posted on our podcast yet to launch uh, called uh, Legal Cut Pro. And I will try to truncate my presentation a little bit. Um, we lost a little bit of time there. But we'll get right into it. So who has worked with lawyers here before? Anyone? OK. All right. Excellent. Good experiences? <laughs> no, don't, don't tell. OK. The best. OK. <laughs> Excellent. So for those of, you new, uh, those of you who have not worked with lawyers, or maybe the lawyers you work with, you don't actually know what they do, I'll just uh, give you a little bit of, and as a lawyer, when people say, well, well what do you actually do? You know, what do you actually do? Anyone recognize where this is from? Yeah. yeah. What, what, what do you really do around here? Okay, so I'll, I'll let you know some of the perceptions of what lawyers do, and then I'll tell you a little, little bit about what I actually do, and then we'll get into the substance of this presentation. So this is what lawyers think, or what clients think lawyers do. Right, that? Anyone recognize this one? Yeah. This is what my parents think I do. I'm not a litigator, so I don't do that. So I'm just going to have a little bit of fun with you here. I'm going to be Tom Cruise. You give me your best Jack Nicholson, okay? Got it? <laughs> I want the truth! You can the truth. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> this is what society thinks we do. It's true. Anybody, anybody a lawyer here? All right, good. All right. I can <laughs> I go on slamming lawyers as much as I want then. This is what society thinks we do. This is what my friends think I do. Do I recognize this? Yeah. Alan Shore, my hero. But this is what I actually do. This is me sitting at my desk. You know, that's the life of a, what they call a solicitor, you know, a desk lawyer rather than a courtroom lawyer. Ironically, though, I haven't actually told you anything about what I actually do except that I sit at a desk and I work very hard. But just a little bit more, a little bit of background about me. I used to work in the film industry on a much different role about 20 years ago. Here are some of the Alberta productions I worked on as a lowly locations PA and various onset roles. Nowadays, I do exercise some kind of, I have a, bit of a creative outlet. This is a mock trial that I, I, I scripted the entire thing and produced it for the Edmonton Comic Expo this past fall, uh, which, was a, which was a hell of a lot of fun. So aside from, this is not about my creative pursuits, it's just give you just a little bit of background about what I do. This is about the law. So today we are going to talk a little bit about, you know, what is entertainment law and why do we care? And then some frequently asked questions or issues that often come up when I work with my clients. You know, can I protect my idea? How does copyright apply to media production, to film and television productions? 
and as well, just a little bit about incorporating. You know, when, when do I incorporate my single purpose production company and why is that important? And if there's anything else you want to know, we'll try to leave plenty of time at the end for questions. I'll try not to make it this a full-blown lecture. I do lecture three hours a week at my class at McEwen University, so I'll try not to bore you too much with the nitty-gritty of the law. So we'll just try to do a high-level overview of the law here. And the goal of all this is not to let you know how to practice law or become lawyers yourself, but rather how to spot issues, perhaps gain an appreciation for a few, just a very few key aspects of the law as it applies to film and television production. And so with that, you may know, you will recognize, may recognize those issues and will know when to seek legal counsel if you run into any problems. Just a really quick disclaimer. <clears throat> this is standard even on our podcast. Nothing in this seminar constitutes legal advice, rather only legal information for educational purposes is being provided here. No client, lawyer-client relationship is established with Gregory Peng or Red Flame Law merely by attending this seminar. Okay. So, and then if some of your questions, and this might be a frustrating answer that you get sometimes from lawyers, and I will give that answer depending on what your question is. If you give me a hypothetical, two words, two favorite lawyer words for answering it, it depends. So what is entertainment law and why should we care? What is entertainment law? Well, entertainment law is not for lawyers. It's not in a practice area in itself, but is rather a whole bunch of different areas of law where lawyers apply to the entertainment industry. Some people call it media law, but I, I don't really like that term because it, it connotes uh, you know, news media. Entertainment law is partly corporate law. You know, you got to form your single purpose production companies, you deal with corporate matters as a business, and a lot of it is contract law. And those of you who have produced, you will see multitudes and multitudes of contracts, even for the smallest productions, you have contracts everywhere. Copyright law is another really big component of it. So what are you creating in the end? You're creating intellectual property. And the only way you have value to that property under our current law is that you have copyright in that piece of intellectual property being your project. There's also privacy law matters. We won't get really into that today, but there are privacy law matters. And those of you who perhaps uh, work on location or uh, well, even if you don't, you know, you have to get releases you know, for people, you know, people appearing in the background perhaps or uh, locations releases for shooting in locations. If you don't, then you could engage privacy law concerns. It's employment law, of course. In any production, you are employing people, or not every production. Some productions can be con you know, contractors. Everyone can be an con independent contractor, but often employment law is engaged. And of course, as you know, labor law. This is a very labor-heavy industry. So all sorts of collective agreements. Trademark law, to a lesser extent, that's uh, one of my larger areas of practice, but trademark law it comes into play when you talk about releases for displaying brands and logos in your film. Now I want to get to protecting your idea. Can I protect my idea? Does anyone know the answer to that? The short answer to that? It depends. It depends. There you go. <laughs> That's a perfect answer. So can I protect my idea? So I take it that a lot of you are producers in here or aspiring producers. And you probably want to protect, you have some ideas that you probably want to protect, right? Well, I'm going to let you know that as a general proposition, you can't protect an idea. And I'll read you a quote here. Quote, there is no such thing as a new idea. It is impossible. We simply take a lot of old ideas and put them into a sort of mental kaleidoscope. We give them a turn and they make new and curious combinations. We keep on turning and make new combinations indefinitely. But they are the same old pieces of colored glass that have been in use through all the ages." Unquote. Mark Twain. Do you agree with this? There are no original ideas. I see, I see a lot of nods there. So why do we even bother? Under copyright law, you don't protect ideas in themselves. Now, you can protect ideas in other ways in terms of disclosure of ideas through what's called non-disclosure agreements and confidentiality clauses. But what I want to talk about today is about copyright law. That under copyright law, it protects expressions of ideas. So copyright law ex protects original expressions of ideas. Yes, go ahead. Um, sort of. We're not quite there yet. Uh, we, that, that would, uh, plagiarism can be wrapped up into infringement, actions in infringement. So we'll get to, uh, I'll talk a little bit about infringement uh, in a second though, but good point. Very good point. 
So we're talking about expressions of idea. Well, what does that exactly mean, expressions of idea? You know, how do you express your ideas? Go ahead. That's bang on. So a particular piece of IP are developed in a, a, like a, a movie or something. But there's, there are many steps in between where you can express your idea. Let's say it, it goes from here in your head, and the first place to express it, if we're talking a dramatic production, is a script. Right? That's your first express, one of your first expressions of your idea, is your script. Now you go from something that's not protectable, being just an idea about some story, to something that's expressed in the script. And then you go down the line, as the gentleman there mentioned, that this expression of your idea can then evolve and new expressions can be created, and that is your, your movie or your television show. And so that is the expression of your idea that is protectable under copyright law. What does that mean, though, protection under copyright law? What do you get? What's that protection? Generally, under copyright law, this first author has the sole right to produce or reproduce their copyrighted work. And author, I mean creator as well. But author is the language used in the Copyright Act. And as that author, you have the right to license or transfer those rights. And you also have what's called the right to integrity or moral rights. Those of you who have read contracts before for talent, things like that, you'll see that little clause, such and such, uh, waives all moral rights and of integrity to the, the results of their um, services. What happens now, again, to your question here about plagiarism? What happens when someone takes your idea? So you have protection, but what, let's go a little bit further with that. What does that mean when you are protected under copyright law? That means that if you have a copyrighted work, and in Canada you don't need to register it, you have a copyrighted work and someone copies it, remember you have the sole right as the owner to produce or reproduce that work. If someone infringes on that right, then you sue them. Easier said than done. That's a very, very expensive thing to do, to sue someone, to tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars. But you sue someone and you ask for damages or an injunction or whatever relief that is going to be appropriate in that case. So that's a simplified way of talking about what you are protecting, what you are creating. And so going forward, you, you can know that you're not so much protecting and creating ideas as content creators, as producers, but you are protecting, you are creating, and that thing that has value that you're hoping to sell to markets, as my uh, friend in the previous panel discussed, that, that is what you are protecting. That is your intellectual property that you are protecting. You are protecting the expression of your idea. Questions about that so far? Go ahead. So two, uh, two questions in your qu question. One is, what can you get if you sue someone for, if someone actually infringes on copyright, and what can you essentially get from them in terms of like, yeah. Okay, and the next question is, how, how expensive are, is to sue someone? <laughs> um, so hypothetically, what, under our, our Copyright Act, after the last round of amendments, we can now get statutory damages. And it depends on what type of infringement it is. If it's commercial or non-commercial, then you have a different level of statutory damages. On top of that, and I won't go through every kind, kind of damage, but you can get what's called accounting for profits. Or you can at least ask. That's part of your relief if you're, if you're uh, suing someone. You ask for an accounting for profits. Someone has taken your script, and someone has written their own script, but has largely ripped off your script, and they're making money off of it. So part of your relief and your claim, you say, I'm going to ask for an accounting for profits, meaning how much money did you make on that from infringing on my work, and you're going to give it to me. And I'm going to get statutory damages from you. Other relief, I mentioned you can get injunction. I mean, that, that's uh, not, not monetary relief. But those are the two standard ones under copyright law. Now, how expensive it is, it could be very, very expensive to sue someone. In first instance, you can be talking about maybe just perhaps just, quote unquote, maybe four or $5,000 to start a statement, you know, to commence a statement of claim. It's to sue someone, to serve someone, and to start that lawsuit. We're not even talking about, st about the stuff be before that. Hopefully that can be settled, these kind of things be can be settled before that. You know, you send a demand letter, either yourself, or you get your legal counsel to send a demand letter, and hopefully they stop, or they pay up if they've actually caused damages or have uh, profited off of your work, right? Beyond that, and this really depends, <laughs> is how far down that litigation route you go. Uh, I'm not much of a litigator. I do have a few litigation files, but I uh, just went through a round of what's called a dispute resolution conference uh, at the federal court for a trademark infringement matter. 
And we were batting numbers around a quarter of a million dollars each party to take this all the way to trial and decision. So way too expensive. Uh, it's another topic altogether about access to justice, like how can, who can litigate other than very, very deep-pocketed people when you're talking about those kinds of costs to be able to have effective legal representation to be able to fight someone over something like this. Yes, go ahead. Oh, no stupid questions. So how do you copyright your work in the first place? In Canada, you don't need to, your copyright exists if it, so this is a little bit circular reasoning, you have copyright in your work if it qualifies as a copyrightable work under the Copyright Act. Uh, so it needs to be an original expression of an idea that is fixed to some material form. You know, that doesn't need, need necessarily mean physical form, but digital or something like that. There are some exceptions, but I won't go through the ex exceptions right now. But you have copyright, essentially, if it qualifies as a work under the Copyrighted Act. Now, you can register it in Canada, and that's good notice to the world that, yes, my script is now registered. I have a registered copyright for that. In the United States, it's a little bit different, and a lot of you are interested in American markets. A lot of times, distributors, if you work with distributors, they'll, they'll say that you must get that U.S. copyright registration through the United States Copyright Office, because unless you get that registration in the United States, under American law, you are not entitled to statutory damages. You cannot get statutory damages unless you register your copyright. But the short answer, yeah. No, not with this writer's deal. This is, this, is the, this is the United States Copyright Office. So I know the writer's deal, that's a little bit of a different thing. But in terms of under, purely under the law, in Canada, you have, again, you have copyright for the proposition that your work is a copyrightable work. I mean, there are, there are best practices to do, but under the law, you don't, there are no further steps you need to make. In the United States, there is additional step of registration if you want to access what's called statutory damages if someone infringes on your work. Yeah. The question up here? Ah, yes. So that is uh, what you're speaking about, essentially sealing your script in an envelope, sealing it and then mailing it to yourself. And then that, what that can go to is evidence that you had written this script at some point in time and it's postmarked and that this is at least the, one of the earliest date that this piece of work has existed. Not, but as you know, not every copyright work can be neatly put into an envelope and mailed to yourself, right? So it, it goes to evidence that you are the copyright owner and that this piece of work existed at such point in time. Now nothing, something like that is, um, it's not conclusive, but again, it's just, it could be evidence, it could be evidence. Now I see a few problems with that and that, well, you know, if you take, you ever take, try to take a hair dryer to try to loosen stickers, like I, you could probably open that envelope and stuff further things in there. It's like, see, look, we have these other drafts of these scripts in here as well since as early as 2006. But it can go to evidence. And um, I think that's all I want to say about that. It could just go to evidence it, right there. Maybe doing something like that can also be evidence. Absolutely. And we'll get the chain of title. We'll get the chain of title right away. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. Okay, back there. Um, uh, so you said you don't have to register it. Correct. Well, Creative Commons is a whole, because I, I use Creative Commons a lot as well, actually, I'm, I'm part of their uh, mailing list, so that's kind of a whole separate conversation altogether, but very related is that copyright can be thought of as you can divide up or layer the rights differently. So if I want to put something on Creative Commons, say I a few pictures I've taken, I can say, instead of saying copyright, Gregory Pang, all rights reserved, full stop, and th therefore I reserve all my rights under copyright, I can say that some rights reserved, and you must merely attribute it to me. And perhaps no commercial use, but you must attribute it to me, and you must state whether you've made any changes or something like that. And I think it's fantastic, because it encourages sharing of copyrighted work while still reserving some rights to yourself as the copyright owner. Okay. Oh, <laughs> follow-up question. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful to read what the terms of that license are, is that, as I mentioned, some rights reserved are that no commercial use. And if you are selling your project in any sort of form, arguably that's commercial use, you're gonna be commercially using their work in your project. So I'd say you have to be, be careful with that and make sure the license grants you what you want it to. 
All right, so we'll get to uh, quickly get to chain of title here. Just want to mind the time. First, before that, just as a really, really quickly, uh, intellectual property, there are three major sets, or actually many, many subsets of uh, intellectual property, but just to let you know, copyright is not trademark, is not patents, okay? So as an example, let's say I have some music on here, and I download some Spotify music on here, legally, of course. The copyright protected works are, is that music that is on my phone, that's downloaded on my phone, right? Patent, this physical piece of technology here, there are probably some kind of patents that relate to this device, this phone here. Registered trademark, this is, the brand of this phone is OnePlus. So there is, there's a brand, Spotify is a brand. So the difference here is that a copyright goes to a work, what most, mainly you guys are doing, a copyright, like a film, a script, or something like that, a work. Before digital came about, I remember when I was learning about this, if you can pick something up and throw it, then that's copyright. Obviously, that doesn't apply in our world of digital <laughs> very well anymore. Trademarks are brands, logos, slogans, and the like. Patents are inventions, okay? The one thing that some drives us IP lawyers crazy sometimes is the media using these interchangeably. It's like, so, such and such as infringe on this person's copyrights. Oh, no, no, you're, you're talking trademarks. That's completely the wrong term. Anyway, just want to just uh, put that in there. When do you, I have copyright. We mentioned, uh, we talked about that um, uh, from answering that question about uh, you, don't, you don't need to register, you have copyright if it qualifies as a copyrighted work. Oh, question? I think you're talking about patents, yeah. Not really. Um, so the test in copyright law is, did the person take a substantial portion of your work and create their own work? And the concepts are, are related but, but different in copyright and patent, that in copyright, you can create derivative works. And as the owner of the copyright of the original work, I still have a right to create those derivative works or to let someone else do it or, uh, or assign the right for someone else to do it, right? So it can't just be, oh, and actually we'll have an example of that in a second, that I have, you have a, uh, an idea for a story about a superhero who wears a red cape. Well, I'm going to do that exact same idea, except I'm going to say blue cape and Ultraman. Uh, I mean, that might not be the best example, but you, and if you, if you copy every other storyline instead of Clark Kent, it's Kent Clark, I, I always forget what, <laughs> what the order is, then if you're still taking a substantial portion of the original work and creating your own work, you're creating a derivative work of that work and you can be liable for copyright infringement. So I say it, the line, it depends, and that each should be evaluated in its, uh, for its own merits and uh, its own facts on whether what you are doing is changing it enough. If it's just the, you're just taking the general idea of some work and creating your whole new spin and whole new story about it, that's one thing, but if you're taking an idea and saying that, well, I like this idea, I'll just change up a few, uh, a few storylines here and there, change up some character names, then you might be getting into a little bit of dangerous territory. But good question, though. All right, so protecting your film production and chain of title. And gentlemen here mentioned uh, chain of title. So with chain of title, why this is important is that we just learned, I just mentioned how as the first author you have uh, of your work or as... Uh, that you have the exclusive right to, or the sole right rather, to produce or reproduce your work. And this applies to everyone in your film production who makes any kind of creative contribution. So by that extension then, if you don't get the right assignments or licenses from especially the key creative people in your production, then it's possible that those people could have copyright claims on your production. Remember, I mentioned that these kind of rights can be licensable or transferable. So you have to get them to do that. You have to get them to transfer those rights to you. And that's why chain of title is so important you know, to broadcasters, financiers. Do you have the sole right to exploit this? And all the are all the creative people, the creative inputs to your production, whether dramatic or documentary, are they properly belonging or licensed to your production company? Sure. <laughs> Um, okay, well, uh, let's see, let me just rewind it. You have to make sure that 
you have all the, the licenses or assignments or the transfer of rights from your key creative people in that, who work on your production. Actually from everyone, but especially the key creative inputs, essentially. And we'll go through some examples of those creative inputs here. Otherwise, if you do not, let's say if you just get together with a whole bunch of, let's say, not even micro budget, like almost no budget, and you get a whole bunch of buddies together, and you shoot something, and no one signs anything, and then you decide to sell it, and then for some reason it becomes the next big thing, you sell it for $150,000 to your first buyer or something like that. And then now there have been no contracts to evidence any kind of transfer or licenses of rights between your writers, your actors, and so on and so forth. All those people could have claims on your property all of a sudden if you, they did not sign that paperwork. So that's where you have to make sure that these people execute those transfers and licenses and or licenses to you, your production company. And with that in mind, I was gonna get, pull up some clip art to chain link these things to illustrate my point, but just as an example, in this slide here are some of those key creative inputs. Like in this example would be a drama, so you have a book option. You know, you need to, you, you option that agreement and then you, before you can do anything with it, you exercise that option. So that becomes part of your chain of title and you have to evidence that. You have your script, you know, and you have to get your contracts with your writers for them to be able to license the proceeds of the results of their work to you as your production company. You have your director, of course, major contributor to your film. Their creative inputs on how to translate this script onto something that looks great onto film, and that is a creative input. Go ahead. If that deal memo has the, that type of license, or sorry, that type of language that effectively transferred those rights, then, then yes. Um, and I just, uh, just a bit of a caveat is that it, it all depends on that language. Is, that, is, it, is it in there and is it effective to affect that kind of transfer? Actors, obviously, key creative input in, in a film, uh, dramatic production. Composers, very, very, very important. And there's other layers of rights you have to deal with there as well, you know, in terms of dealing with the music. S sound effects artists, or sound effects, special effects artists, picture editors, of course, and so on and so on. And as your project matures, this chain of title lengthens. So in the beginning, you might, these, okay, where, what's my chain of title? Well, we have a draft script. So it could be essentially just two contracts. But as it goes on, your chain of title lengthens, then you need to prove that chain is rock solid in order to mitigate any chances or le lessen any chances of any one of these people, creative people having, creative inputs having a claim on your production. Questions about that? Any more? So Go ahead. No, that's, that's cool. For a writer in particular, no, no, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. okay. Uh, well, I'll I'll take writer for example because that's an example. So the question is, you know, how how would this actually look like in in a contract, right? So you, those of you who have seen a contract, and those of you haven't, it's usually in a section called grant of rights or transfer of rights or something to that effect. And with a writer, they would be licensing if the script doesn't exist yet. They would be licensing their rights in, in the work to your production company. So it says something that such and such writer uh, licenses the right in perpetuity for all media, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to your production company. And so you can do what you want, essentially so that you can do what you want with the script. And that kind of language can be similar for other cre creative inputs as well, except perhaps not a license, but perhaps an outright transfer in, in some cases. And uh, I, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of that, but uh, uh, that's, that's where, you know, if you consult with counsel on that language in particular for that creative input, they can tell you whether it's adequate or not. But essentially that's what it is. It's, it's this one section in a contract that says that they are giving you, the production company, a right to exploit the proceeds of whatever they are contributing to your film. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. okay, excellent. All right. Just a little bit about fair dealing. I was asked to talk a little bit about the recent amendments, and this is the last round of amendments to the Copyright Act that you might take some interest in. And because there, I bring this up as well because there are some misconceptions about what this means. Go ahead. I can, I can post this actually uh, my, on SlideShare, and um, 
I'll put up my email afterwards. You want to just shoot me an email, I can let you know when it's uh, going up. Uh, I might remove some of the content for you know, copyright reasons, but <laughs> it depends, exactly. But uh, yeah, I can, I can post a slide share of this and then I'll put a link on social media or on my website or something like that, but yeah. So there's a lot of misconception, not a lot, but there's sometimes a misconception about what, we have a parity exception now in our fair dealing. And those, uh, you've heard of fair use before? Crowd? Yeah, yeah. So fair dealing, okay, so uh, not everyone has heard of fair use. So fair use is an American term. Our term is called fair dealing in Canada. So it's essentially these are defenses to infringement. Right? So there are certain exceptions to infringement that you could possibly rely on as a defense. They're not necessarily licenses. You can't say, well, we have parity laws now, so we can parity whatever we want because we have parity laws. Well, not necessarily, because it goes, the, the analysis goes a little bit deeper than that. So if, if you are trying to rely on fair dealing, and I won't get too much into the legal language of this, but the dealing in itself that you are if you're relying on this defense, is that the dealing must be fair. That's why it's called fair dealing. It must be fair in terms of the purpose of the dealing, the character of dealing, that's how you're using it, the amount of the dealing, how much of the copyrighted work you are essentially infringing on, upon. Were there alternatives to the dealing? What is the nature of your work and the effect of the dealing? Okay, so this is a test that's actually laid out by the courts on when you want to rely on parody or satire as a fair dealing defense, they will apply this test in the courts. And a fair dealing does not, it cannot be for some kind of competitive purpose. And we'll get to, I'll talk a little bit about 29.21 non-commercial user generated content, because this is very, very new. There is no case law on it yet. Essentially it is, they called it the YouTube exception when this was in committee and the, the amendments were being proposed, essentially for mashups. You know, you want to make a mashup, put it to YouTube. This is non-commercial user-generated content. Key though is non-commercial. If you do that same mashup and then all of a sudden you're making money off of it, this fair dealing defense does not apply whatsoever. Okay? And uh, I have, this is a particular interest to me because I've, I've read, there's some case law, recent interesting case law out there in the United States where there have been fan fiction and fan art. And in Canada, as long as it's non-commercial, you may be able to rely on non-commercial user-generated content fair dealing defense. But that analysis has to go a little bit deeper, uh, but I just wanted to just mention that. Go ahead. Is that the parody and satire uh, fair dealing, is that equitable in the US under their parody situation? There, in the United States, it's much more developed uh, in terms of a fair use defense. Uh, and I've worked with American Council on this before. Um, and there was a very, for US copyright lawyers and any copyright, uh, even Canadian copyright lawyers, the one case that really set the precedent for parody in the United States was, do you remember the band? It was in a rap group called Two Live Crew in 1990. Yeah, I won't, <laughs> I used to listen to that stuff, okay, so you can see what kind of person I am. Two Live Crew. And they had a, a, a song called Pretty Woman, uh, or they, they parodied the song Pretty Woman. Essentially, it sounded a lot like the song Pretty Woman. And this went, this went to the courts. And so essentially, what I'm saying is that parody is much more developed in case law there. So it operates somewhat similar, though, but it's much, much more developed. Parody did not appear uh, in our fair dealing defense in Canada until very you know, fairly recently in the last uh, copyright amendments, but it's a good question. What was the result of that? Two Live Crew won. Yeah, yeah, to my recollection, Two Live Crew won, and uh, now um, I, I, I want to listen to that song again, though, but <laughs> maybe, maybe not, because <laughs> then my seven-year-old might uh, find it on my Spotify or something, and say, what's that, Daddy? <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Quick question about Curry, though. Go ahead. question is whether you want to take that step to approach the original, the, the rights holder, it could be the publisher, who uh, has the rights to this and you say you want to make a parody, right? So that's a little bit different because what we're talking about here is the fair dealing defense. You don't have permission and you're relying on this defense. And this is what Weird Al Yankovic does actually. You know, he actually, at least to what my knowledge is, he doesn't just parody and just release it. He goes, gets the licenses because he makes a lot of money too, right? Weird Al has been around for a long time. Uh, and I really like his, uh, what's that, that parody of, uh, 
Anakin, uh, the Star Wars one, yeah. Uh, the, the saga begins. Yeah, yeah, the, the saga begins. That's what, it, that's what his song is. That's a fantastic one. And I'm a Star, Star Wars nerd as well. Um, but that, that's a little bit different because then you're approaching to get a license, right? And if you get that license, then you don't need to even you know, worry about fair dealing or fair use because you have that permission. And as the rights holder, they have the right to grant you that permission. Of course, for a little bit of, little bit of money, you know, whatever that contract might look like. But, it's, uh, but that's a good question, though. So you can not even have to worry about fair dealing if you have that license. Okay. All right, so about parity, and that, that's a good segue into this here. This is an old case, and I'm just going to warn you that this is, this is a 1999 case, so it's before the recent uh, amendments adding parity to fair dealing, but it is instructive, at least, on how the Canadian courts have viewed parity. So for those of you who produce any kind of comedy or then, and you're tempted to do parody, then just take note of this. And I'll read it here. So this case is called, uh, this is the Production of Anti Ciné Video and Favreau, uh, 1999 Quebec Court of Appeal decision. And it concerned, a ch I think it was a children's work called La Petite Vie, like the little life. Some kind of children's work. I, I don't remember the exact details of it. But then came along this Favreau guy, and he decided to make essentially a porno based on all the, essentially very much all the likenesses of all the characters of La Petite Vie, and call it La Petite Vite, which I, I'm not really caught up on my Québécois and joie, but uh, uh, I think that means orgasm or something like that. I, I don't know. Um, but some kind of slang for that. What's that? A little quickie? Yeah, a well, little, little fast, literally, but yeah, so quickie. Okay, thank you for that clarification. <laughs> so I'll just, uh, I'll just read this. There is, in my view, an important line separating a parody of the dramatic work created by another writer or artist and the appropriation or use of that work solely to capitalize or cash in on its originality and popularity. In this case, the respondent was on the wrong side of that line. Far from a parody of an original dramatic work, La Petite Vite constituted a crass attempt to gain instant public recognition without having to create characters, costumes, decor, or situation. La Petite Vite had supplied the characters, the costumes, and the mise en scene. Once that was obtained by the respondent, he had only to supply the simple pornographic activity for the success of La Petite Vite. Whatever the dramatic merits of La Petite Vite, I see no parody, criticism, or originality in it, simply adding pornographic activity as a storyline for characters that have been appropriated from another writer's work does not, in my opinion, constitute parody or fair use of that material. So that's a little bit of an illustration, a little bit of an, on the extreme end, of course, you know, creating a porno based on a popular children's work. And just quickly here, I just want to talk a little bit about incorporating in the context of a single purpose production company? Because this question comes up a lot. You know, should I incorporate my single pur purpose production company? Of course, the short answer is, you guessed it, it depends. So who, has, uh, who can tell me, does anyone know, what, what does incorporating mean anyway? What, what, what is the net result of? You've done the corporation and then liability is minimized. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So what corporate, that very good, so it goes to liability. So when you incorporate, you are actually creating a separate legal entity that's recognized under Canadian law as separate legal existence from yourself as a director of the company. It is a limited liability, I don't want to use the term shield, but it limits the liability of the shareholder. The shareholders are not liable for the liabilities of the corporation. Okay, so that's, that's our starting point here. So what does that, why is that even relevant? So when you are, let's say you have a, you've already incorporated a company and you, you run some production through it and production activities, development, or whatever. And why would you want to incorporate that single purpose production company? It depends on whose perspective, okay? Go ahead. Uh, any technical safety issues? Yeah, that's right. And that's a fantastic answer. Like safety is a fantastic example of that, is that you essentially want to separate the liabilities of your single purpose production company, which you're producing your project, and the activities and the liabilities of your mother company, let's call it that, your head, head, your head, court, head company where you have perhaps a lot of your assets in. You don't want what happens in your single purpose production company during production for then all of a sudden someone to have a claim on all the assets in your head company because something happened there. Similarly, 
And now we're getting to the perspective of, say, the broadcaster, the distributor. Sometimes they say, you must incorporate a single-purpose production company because they don't know and they don't want to do all the due diligence on what all the possible liabilities, employ, you know, WCB claims, employment standards claims, and other judgments, you know, personal property registrations, whatever liens are on your main company. They don't want to endanger their asset that they're providing you with that half a million dollar license fee because there are some, unfor- maybe not unforeseen for them, unknown liabilities from whatever activities you were embarking on in your, your main company, your head company. So that from their perspective, it's about limiting the risk to them as well, that we don't want to do all due diligence. We do our due diligence on you, the, the, the creative people, the producers, but we want that, uh, all the liabilities contained to that. We don't want any essentially cross-contaminating between the head company and the single-purpose production company. They could be affiliated, and the term under the Business Corporation Act, they could be affiliated corporations, whether they could be, say, your mother company could be the whole a simple relationship would be the 100% owner of the single-purpose production company, so they are affiliated, but the, the liability still will not spread to that company, right? Directors is another matter. We don't talk about directors' liability, but directors do have some liability. Uh, or they could be where, let's say, yourself as owner of your head mother company, and you yourself can be owner of this single-purpose production company. And for the purposes of the Business Corporation Act, it, those could be um, deemed as affiliated as well. But they're not, again, the, the liabilities won't cross in between the two just because of that. Okay. Uh, the question about liability and uh, incorporation, is it realistic? So if somebody is incorporated and then you're a major actor, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. So uh, I'll just repeat it for purposes of recording here, um, is that the question is, well, if someone's going to sue you, they're going to try to go after the owners anyway, right? So in theory, it's limited liability, but there's nothing stopping them from suing the owners, the shareholders. So yes, however, it, when someone starts a claim, and I've seen this happen, they'll just name everyone they can name to cover, like, cover the battlefield, essentially. That we're, we're naming everyone as a potential defendant because we want to hit the people with the deepest pockets here. I think they would have a really tough time to what's called, the term is piercing the corporate veil to get to those shareholders unless there's been some kind of uh, criminal activity or some kind of other improper use of the corporation for some kind of uh, like scam purpose or something like that. So the legal, te- it'd be very, very difficult. It's a very high bar for them generally to pierce the corporate veil and go after the shareholders. That doesn't stop them from naming them in a lawsuit. You can name anyone in a lawsuit to, to your loss- as a defendant to your lawsuit. But when it comes time for them to actually become successful, well, they're going to have, I think, unless you have those other elements present, they'll have a, a really tough hill to climb, and they can pierce court veil because X, Y, Z, case law, et cetera, et cetera, and have that claim dismissed. So the short answer is yes, they can name anyone, including the owners, even though this, there's a limited liability here because they're incorporated. But would they have good chances of success? Would they have any merits of success is a whole other question. Good question, though. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the question is about whether we have LLCs, limited liability companies in Canada. Unfortunately, we don't. Those are not separate, to my understanding of American law, those are not separate legal entities, but they have the same effect of limiting liability. And a lot of American businesses, uh, law firms and Production companies will use the LLC vehicle, which we do not have, uh, as of yet in Canada at least. So in Canada, we do have to go full-blown incorporation. Uh, we are quickly running out of time here. Uh, oh, one question at the back. Very, very um, when you incorporate, does it mean you legally or um, you have to go federally? You, it, that depends on where, what you are doing and in, in what jurisdiction. You're, like, say, for in Alberta you'll probably want to, because it's easier to demonstrate if you're going for AMF grant, and it might be easier to demonstrate that this is a wholly 50, more than 50% owned corporation. And look, it's, it's an Alberta corporation here. Uh, federal incorporations, I've done those, many, many of those in the past. There are circumstances when you might want to do that, and those are all case by case. So I'd say that by default, by default, it's usually an Alberta corporation if you're an Alberta producer. There may be special circumstances that you may want to look at federal incorporation. And I know that's a bit of a vague answer, but uh, that's, uh, that's the best I can give you right now. 
All right. So just in summary, I went through a little bit about you know, what is entertainment law and wh why does it matter to us because we are, whether you like it or not, we're presumed to know the law, meaning that if you get charged with a criminal offense, just an extreme example, and you say to officer, but I didn't, or judge, I didn't know that I could only have 10 grams of weed in my pocket in the public. Well, you're presumed to know the law, too bad. You know, your ignorance of the law is no defense of the law, and that applies to civil law as well, not just criminal law. Can I protect my idea? We went through how protecting ideas in themselves is not protectable under Copyright Act, but the expressions of ideas are. And we talked a little bit about copyright in media productions, what is copyright, fair dealing, and what is, we talked a little bit about chain of title. And we just uh, went over a little bit about incorporating a company. Uh, that is the end. Uh, and we have maybe a minute for questions, but I just want to just plug, I know I'm not supposed to pump my own tires here, but I just want to plug my To Be Coming Out podcast, Legal Cut Pro. We've already recorded some content. We have not launched yet, but it is a podcast with, entertainment law podcast with myself and Michelle Molyneux. And we are hopefully going to be launching in a couple of weeks. Anyway, uh, any questions? Any other questions? Go ahead. I'll answer that by saying that that's some of the work I do. Um, you don't, obviously, you don't have to choose me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, legal counsel who works with film and television productions can provide assistance in clearances. Um, they, they might not be the ones providing you with that clearance report. Like what I do is I will work with the, uh, the producer in terms of I, I will, of course, read the script. We will get the, usually get the script cleared by a clearance house. You know, they'll, they'll provide a script clearance report. Then I will look at what they flag and what I flag, and then I can adv I'll advise the producer accordingly on, hey, you might want to look out for this, or you might need help with this. Or let's say if a producer comes to me and says, look, I'm having problems with this logo that someone is wearing that appears on camera, and it's pretty prominent, and the, the rights holder, whatever company, says they don't sign releases. Okay? They just don't sign releases because they get so many request, they don't sign releases, what do I do? Heirs and mission insurance, the insurer says that I have to get releases for every single logo that appears, can you help me? And I can help with that. You know, so I can talk to the insurer or I can talk to counsel for the insurer and say, hey, look, the use of this logo is in this ordinary context, et cetera, et cetera, so I think there's very unlikely there's gonna be any kind of claim. Please do not exclude that from the coverage of uh, errors and emissions. So just, that's just an example of what I would do. But yeah, uh, um, legal counsel, whoever works in this uh, area would be able to assist you as well. Anything else? Oh, one more back there. Yeah, we, we are, that, that is the plan, to be part of that network. So, so yes. <laughs> yeah, one more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So can you use a, just a general release form for, for your, your, all, all the key contributors to your... Maybe that's a small choice for uh, I, I can't answer definitively on there, but there are... Uh, the question earlier is, well, can we just use a deal memo? Deal memos are essentially pretty short contracts that could contain that, that proper language that is fairly template and is usually adaptable to multiple situations. So that kind of contract or template of a contract could be adequate, could be, yeah. So depending, so I know mine are pretty good, but I, I don't know about, if you just find one on the internet, then, you, then you're on your own, right? <laughs> so yeah, uh, anything else? I think maybe just one more quick one. Um, let's say I want to use work from Mozart. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Mozart's dead. Mozart's dead, yeah. So let's take the Mozart example one for now. He's been dead for longer. Than, okay, so the, the term of copyright is currently life plus 50, but with a USMCA, it's going to be life plus 70, looks like. So he's been dead longer than that, right? So uh, as a general proposition, his, the compositions of his work are public domain. However, let's say someone... Uh, an orchestra, the, let's see, the Calgary uh, Philharmonic Orchestra recorded a piece of Mozart's work, let's say last year. That is still, they, they have copyright protection to their performance of that work, even though the composition itself is in public domain. 
So you can't just take someone else's performance of that public domain work and say, yeah, we can, we can just use it for whatever then. So you have to separate, you have to look at the layers of rights here. So what, what is public domain and what has been made of it and is that public domain as well? Uh, so it's, it's a yes and no answer. So if you're looking at purely the composition, then it's likely the answer is yes. He, Mozart's been dead for what, like 200 years or something like that? But if you're looking at more recent performances that, are so, that could have copyright attached to them of those public domain compositions, then there are probably copyright attached to those. All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much. You've been great. You can come up to me and ask any questions. Uh, I'll hang around for a little bit. <laughs>